Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew, in case we haven't met. Uh, I'm one of the pastoral team here at DPC, uh, and it's a joy to be with you together. This narrative that we've just read is amazing, amazing stuff, and yet so different from the previous chapters of Acts we've gone through so far. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm thankful for the privilege of opening it with you today. Uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for your love for each one of us. We thank you that we can know you, worship you, and be part of your family because of what Jesus has done. Please speak your word to our hearts now by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. In amateur sports teams, there are jokes you hear about players who aren't very good, that they shouldn't be on the field very much. You know, they might be called bench warmers. They should just sit on the, sit on the bench, keep it warm while the better players play. Uh, one year, I joined a soccer team, and at the first training session, we all introduced ourselves and, and told our name and, and what position we usually play. So we go around the circle, hi, I'm Liam. I play centre back. Hi, I'm uh, James. I play left wing. Hi, I'm Andrew. I play right wing. And then the next guy says, with, with a completely straight face, Hi, I'm Graham. I play left right out. And uh, <laughs> some of us were puzzled. I haven't heard of that position before, left right out. But he was making a joke that he should be left right out of the game, let the better players play. Sometimes we can have a laugh about being left out, about being excluded. Sometimes it's not really a big deal, but, but in other parts of life, it, it is a big deal. In these COVID times, some of us have been physically separated from loved ones or from church community for a short or long time. And it's costly. It's costly on relationships when you're excluded, when you're separated. And that cost is felt the most by those who are left out. And although some of us might not feel a sense of that exclusion at the moment, before the work of Christ, that was our state before God, excluded, separated from God, completely left out because of our sin. We're defiled by sin, and, and so it's right for us to be separated from God's holiness, his holy presence. So our question for today is, is, what does God do for the outcast? What does God do for the one who is excluded, left right out? And in the passage today, we meet a man who is excluded, left right out, the Ethiopian eunuch will meet soon. He was excluded from God's people. He was not allowed under the old covenant to be part of their worship. So first, to see what God does for this man in Christ, we'll walk through the narrative and then we'll have a look at the three characters in the story to have a bit, bit of a closer look. So, so first, let's walk through the narrative. Come with me to verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. Wow! Philip is told by an angel of the Lord to go to this very particular road. It's a, it's a divine instruction. It's a very specific divine instruction. Now Philip... We haven't met him much so far, but he's one of the men, the seven men chosen back in chapter 6, along with Stephen, who we heard about last week. And these were men known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. They were chosen to help distribute food equally among the widows, among the church. But just like Stephen, Philip is gifted, equipped for not just serving tables, but for preaching the gospel. Earlier in chapter 8, Philip had been in Samaria, 
Samaria, sharing the gospel, performing signs and wonders, and many people were baptized into Jesus. We're seeing more and more of that Acts storyline come to fruition. You know, Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We're seeing more of this come about. But get this, right? Philip was preaching the gospel to a whole city when he received this specific divine instruction, preaching to many people, lots of people being baptized, and the Lord commands him to leave that and go to a desert road. Go walk along a road in the desert. This, this is bizarre from a human point of view. Imagine an evangelist preaching on the steps of the opera house and crowds and crowds flocking to hear them. Many people believing in the Lord Jesus. Would we suggest, hey mate, why don't you leave that for a moment, go for a drive out to Dubbo and see who you meet on the road? It's crazy. But God has something else in mind for Philip. Throughout the book of Acts so far, we've seen mass gatherings, mass conversions, but here we zoom in on one man, one man. Verse 27 introduces us to a eunuch from Ethiopia. He is an official of the queen of Ethiopia, and he's been up to Jerusalem to worship. And now he's on his way home on this very desert road that God told Philip to go to. And he's reading a scroll of Isaiah, the prophet. This is amazing. It, it's no coincidence that he's reading God's word. It's no coincidence that these two men happen to be in the same place at the same time. Rather, we see God's fingerprints all over this situation. God has orchestrated this situation for these two men to meet and to have a conversation. He says, go, go, Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And so Philip's running alongside this horse-drawn chariot, running along, and he must have legs of steel to keep up, right? He's, he's running up alongside a chariot. For someone whose name actually means lover of horses, Philip, Philip doesn't even need a horse. But probably panting from all this exercise, Philip asks the eunuch sitting in his chariot, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch humbly admits his ignorance and invites Philip to, to guide him. How can I, unless someone explains it to me? And we find out the very passage this eunuch is reading is Isaiah 53, in which God speaks about his suffering servant who will die for the sins of many. Of all the parts of the Old Testament, the eunuch is reading about Jesus who, would die, who, who had died for his sins, who would die for sins of many. You know, God's fingerprints continue to appear. What are the chances that he's reading this very part of Isaiah? And so Philip sees this opportunity and makes the most of it. He begins in verse 35 with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news of Jesus. Then the eunuch believes the good news and asks to be baptized straight away. God has ordained this man to believe, preparing his heart by the Holy Spirit and giving him the scriptures. And so the man is baptized, and after they come up out of the water, Philip's gone, he's taken away. His task is obviously complete, and the Spirit takes him away to preach the gospel elsewhere. And the eunuch, he's left without his messenger, but left with a message. He no longer has Philip as his guide, but he has the Holy Spirit. And he goes on his way rejoicing. Right? This is an amazing story. God's fingerprints all over it. But after this, after this story in Acts, both Philip and the eunuch virtually disappear. Philip's mentioned one other time. So why this story? Why is this story of just two men included 
in the book of God's work in the book of Acts? Well, I think it's because it demonstrates that God welcomes the outcast. We see what God does for the one who is excluded, the one who is left right out. And so let's, let's think a bit more about this by looking at the three characters, the eunuch, Philip, and God. So firstly, let's consider the eunuch and what God does for him. At the start of this narrative, the eunuch is an outcast of God's people. He's an outcast on several levels. The man is from Ethiopia, right? That's, that's like in the middle of Africa. And if you think how far it is from there up to Jerusalem, this man has traveled over, probably over 4,000 kilometers. This is further than Sydney to Perth. That's how far he's traveled up to worship at the temple. And he's on his way back. That's how far removed. He's a, he's a geographical outcast. And more than that, he's, he's a social outcast. Just picture it. Once, once he's traveled that way, he'd stick out like a sore thumb. The man's from Ethiopia, much darker skin than everyone else around, probably wearing Ethiopian dress as an official to the queen. And as an official to the queen, everyone knows that to be an official to the queen, you've got to be a eunuch. This man is a geographical outcast, he's a social outcast, and what's more, he's a religious outcast. You might have noticed that throughout the passage, he's referred to again and again as the eunuch. The eunuch, the eunuch, not, not the Ethiopian, not the official, but the eunuch. And this emphasizes that the most significant way this man was excluded is because he's a eunuch. There's an Old Testament law that prohibits eunuchs from participating in worship in the temple. Deuteronomy 23 verse 1 says, No one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. But bam This eunuch is he's not allowed in. He travels all that way and he's not even allowed in. He is excluded. He's an outcast. He's left right out. So what does God do for him? What does God do for someone like him? Well, he's got this book of Isaiah. And we find out that in this scroll, there's a profound message for people like him. Come with me to verse 32. This is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Perhaps this suffering servant of Isaiah 53, this man who was despised and rejected, perhaps he particularly resonates with the eunuch. He also is a man who is treated as an outcast. And so the eunuch wants to know, who, who is this guy? Is, it, is the prophet talking about himself or is he speaking about someone else? Well, the prophet Isaiah is speaking about Jesus 700 years or so in advance, he's speaking about when Jesus was led away by soldiers out of the temple, out of the city, and nailed up to a cross, killed like a criminal, when he was cast out. Jesus became the outcast. Jesus suffered rejection so that you could have acceptance. Jesus suffered injustice so that you could have mercy. Jesus suffered death so that you could have life. The one who's one being with the Father, very God, the eternal Son of God, 
He's treated as an outcast so that the outcast could be welcomed in. He allowed himself to be separated from the Father so that that curtain that blocked off the temple could be turn in, torn in two and men like this eunuch could be welcomed in and have access to God. And this is actually a fulfilment of another promise in Isaiah. In Isaiah 56, you might like to turn there in your Bibles. Isaiah 56 has a promise for eunuchs. Isaiah 56 is on page 1,151, if you'd like to turn there in your blue Bibles. I'll read from verse 4. For this is what the Lord says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. This promise that there will be a time and has now come, that time has now come when eunuchs who commit themselves to God will find welcome and inclusion. They can't physically have their own children. They can't have their own sons and daughters to continue their name, but they're given a better name, a, an everlasting name. They are called children of God, co-heirs with Christ. And even now, we are remembering this eunuch, who isn't even named in the text, but we're remembering him because he was brought in to God's family. He was brought into God's family for eternity. When, um, when Rachel and I got together, uh, her family really welcomed me as a son and a brother. And we often stay in their house when we go down to Canberra to visit. And I'm treated like family. I get to join in on the family meals, the family barbecues, where they have some of the most delicious steak. I get to help myself in the kitchen for a cup of tea or a snack whenever I want. I get to sit on the couch and watch the cricket with Rachel's dad. I'm part of the family. I'm welcomed in. This son-in-law is treated as a son, and it's awesome. This is like what God does, but God does even better. God does even more. He asks his only beloved son to give up his seat at the table and be treated like an outcast so that the outcast can come in, sit at the table, and be treated like a son. This is the gospel. In, in answer to the question, what does God do for the outcast? God himself comes down as a man and takes the place of the outcast so that the outcast can be welcomed into God's family, so that the outcast can come into God's presence. That's what God does for outcasts like this eunuch, for outcasts like you and I once were. Now that we've answered what God does for the outcast by looking at the eunuch, if we look at Philip, we can see how he does it. How does God do this for outcasts? Because we see that God does it through his people, through his people like Philip, through his people like you and me. At the start of our text today, in verse 26, the angel tells Philip, get up and go. And what does Philip do? He got up and he went. Philip displays this precise, immediate obedience to that precise divine instruction. In Philip, we see a, a ready and willing messenger, a ready and willing messenger of the gospel. Is that how someone would describe you? A ready and willing messenger of the gospel? Look at what Philip does. He obeys God's direction and he's aware that God might place an opportunity before him. And then he just 
he starts a conversation. He starts a life-changing conversation, actually. He starts it with a simple question. Do you know what you're reading? Philip just brings his readiness, his simple question, and God brings the life change. Jesus, we read, did not open his mouth. He was silent, like a lamb led to the slaughter. So that people like Philip, people like you and I, might open our mouths and speak about him, about the one who suffered silently. Now, if you're anything like me, doing what Philip did is a bit daunting. But I think there are two things from the narrative today that can encourage us to learn from Philip's example. And they come from seeing the way God is at work in this story. So third person, third character, God. What Philip does is simple, but what God does is life-changing. Philip's ready for the opportunity. He's aware that God is at work. So we can be freed up to just ask a simple question. Maybe, maybe it's the barber or hairdresser when you sit down for a haircut. Hey, how's your day going? Maybe it's the parent you see at the park or at the school pickup. Maybe it's the barista at the cafe you go to. Maybe it's the neighbor you see in their garden each day. Ask a question, start a conversation, and see where God leads it. God provides Philip with the opportunity and the good news to share. And we can expect that he'll provide that for us too. So the second thing is that God himself, he is the sovereign evangelist. He's the one in control of the situation. He orchestrates what happens here. God told Philip what to do, where to go. God ordains and prepares the eunuch. He has the scriptures. God, the capital E evangelist, he ordains and prepares people to hear the gospel and directs us to go and tell it. So DPC, let's be encouraged to start conversations, to ask a question. Because that might be the way God orchestrates people, outcasts, to come into his family. He might use you to bring outcasts into his family. I'll close with a prayer, one of my favourite prayers from the liturgy at the church where I grew up. Because in it, we thank and praise God for bringing us in while we were far off. And we pray that he might ask us, that we pray that he might use us to bring others in. So let's pray. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us in this hope that we have grasped, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.